So your group at MIT is trying to understand the molecular basis of human disease. What are some of the biggest challenges in your view? Don't get me started. I mean, <laughs> we go understanding again. human disease is the most complex uh, challenge in modern science. So because human disease is as complex as the human genome, it is as complex as the human brain, and it is in many ways even more complex because the more we understand disease complexity, the more we start understanding genome complexity and epigenome complexity and brain circuitry complexity and immune system complexity and cancer complexity and so on and so forth. So traditionally, human disease was following basic biology. You would basically understand basic biology and model organisms like, you know, mouse and fly and yeast. You would understand sort of mammalian biology and animal biology and eukaryotic biology in sort of progressive layers of complexity, getting closer to human phylogenetically. And you would do perturbation experiments in those species to see if I knock out a gene, what happens? And based on the knocking out of these genes, you would basically then have a way to drive human biology because you would, you would sort of understand the functions of these genes. And then if you find that a human gene locus, something that you've mapped from human genetics, to that gene is related to a particular human disease, you'd say, aha, now I know the function of the gene from the model organisms. I can now go and understand the function of that gene in human. But this is all changing. This is dramatically changed. So that, that was the old way of doing basic biology. You would start with the animal models, the eukaryotic models, the mammalian models, and then you would go to human. Human genetics has been so transformed in the last decade or two that human genetics is now actually driving the basic biology. There is more genetic mutation information in the human gen genome than there will ever be in any other species. What do you mean by mutation information? So, so perturbations is how you understand systems. So an engineer builds systems and then they know how they work from the inside out. A scientist studies systems through perturbations. You basically say, if I poke that balloon, what's going to happen? And I'm going to film it in super high resolution, understand, I don't know, air dynamics or fluid dynamics, if it's filled with water, et cetera. So you can then make experimentation by perturbation. And then the scientific process is sort of building models that best fit the data, designing new experiments that best test your models and challenge your models and so on and so forth. That's the same thing with science. Basically, if you're trying to understand biological science, you basically want to do perturbations that then drive the models. So how do these perturbations allow you to understand disease? So if, if you know that a gene is related to disease, you don't want to just know that it's related to the disease. You want to know what is the disease mechanism because you want to go and intervene. So the way that I like to describe it is that traditionally uh, epidemiology which is basically the study of disease, uh, you know, sort of the observational study of disease, has been about correlating one thing with another thing. So if you, if you have a lot of people with liver disease who are also alcoholics, you might say, well, maybe the alcoholism is driving the liver disease, or maybe those who have liver disease self-medicate with alcohol. So the, the connection could be either way. With genetic epidemiology, it's about correlating changes in the genome with phenotypic differences. And then you know the direction of causality. So if you know that a particular gene is related to the disease, you can basically say, okay, perturbing that gene in mouse causes the mice to have X phenotype. So perturbing that gene in human causes the humans to have the disease. So I can now figure out what are the detailed molecular phenotypes in the human that are related to that organismal phenotype in the disease. So it's all about understanding disease mechanism, understanding what are the pathways, what are the tissues, what are the processes that are associated with the disease so that we know how to intervene. You can then prescribe particular medications that also alter these processes. You can prescribe lifestyle changes that also affect these processes and so on and so forth. That's such a beautiful puzzle to try to solve like what kind of perturbations eventually have this ripple effect that leads to a disease across the population. And then you study that for animals or mice, 
first and then see how that might possibly connect to humans. How hard is that puzzle of trying to figure out how little perturbations might lead to, in a stable way, to a disease? In animals, we make the puzzle simpler because we perturb one gene at a time. That's the beauty of it's the power of animal models. You can basically decouple the perturbations. You only do one perturbation and you only do strong perturbations at a time. In human, the puzzle is incredibly complex because, I mean, obviously you don't do human experimentation. You wait for natural selection and natural genetic variation to basically do its own experiments, which it has been doing for hundreds and thousands of years in the human population and for hundreds of thousands of years across you know, the, the history leading to the human population. So you basically take this natural genetic variation that we all carry within us. Every one of us carries 6 million perturbations. So I've done 6 million experiments on you, 6 million experiments on me, 6 million experiments on every one of 7 billion people on the planet. What's the 6 million correspond to? 6 million unique genetic variants that are segregating the human population. Every one of us carries millions of polymorphic sites. Poly, many, morph, forms. Polymorphic means many forms, variants. That basically means that every one of us has single nucleotide alterations that we have inherited from mom and from dad that basically can be thought of as tiny little perturbations. Most of them don't do anything. But some of them lead to all of the phenotypic differences that we see between us. The reason why two twins are identical is because these variants completely determine the way that I'm going to look at exactly 93 years of age. How happy are you with this kind of data set? Is it uh, large enough of the, the human population of Earth? Is that too big, too small? Yeah, so, so the, the, is, it, is it large enough is a power analysis question. And in every one of our grants, we do a power analysis based on what is the effect size that I would like to detect and what is the natural variation in the two forms. So every time you do a perturbation, you're asking, I'm changing form A into form B. Form A has some natural genetic, some natural phenotypic variation around it. And form B has some natural phenotypic variation around it. If those variances are large and the differences between the mean of A and the mean of B are small, then you have very little power. The further the means go apart, that's the effect size, the more power you have. And the smaller the standard deviation, the more power you have. So basically, when you're asking, is that sufficiently large? Certainly not for everything, but we already have enough power for many of the stronger effects in the more tight distributions. So that's a hopeful message that there exists parts of the genome that ha that have a strong effect, that has a small uh, variance. That's exactly right. Unfortunately, those perturbations are the basis of disease in many cases. So it's not a you know hopeful message. Sometimes it's a terrible message. It's basically, well, some people are sick, but if, when, if we can figure out what are these contributors to sickness, we can then help make them better and help many other people better who don't carry that exact mutation but who carry mutations on the same pathways. And that's what we like to call the allelic series of a gene. You basically have many perturbations of the same gene in different people, each with a different frequency in the human population and each with a different effect on the individual that carries them. So you said uh, in the past, there would be these small experiments on perturbations and animal models. What is this puzzle solving process look like today? So we basically have, you know, something like 7 billion people in the planet and every one of them carries something like 6 million mutations. You basically have an enormous matrix of genotype by phenotype by systematically measuring the phenotype of these individuals. And the traditional way of measuring this phenotype has been to look at one trait at a time. You would gather families and you would sort of paint the pedigrees of a strong effect, what we like to call Mendelian mutation. So a mutation that gets transmitted in a dominant or a recessive, but strong effect form. 
where basically one locus plays a very big role in that disease. And you can then look at carriers versus non-carriers in one family, carriers versus non-carriers in another family, and do that for hundreds, sometimes thousands of families, and then trace these inheritance patterns, and then figure out what is the gene that plays that role. Is this the matrix that you've shown in, in, um, in talks or lectures? So that matrix is the input to the stuff that I show in talks. So basically that matrix has traditionally been strong effect genes. What the matrix looks like now is instead of pedigrees, instead of families, you basically have thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of unrelated individuals, each with all of their genetic variants and each with their phenotype, for example, height or lipids or you know whether they're sick or not for a particular trait. That has been the modern view. Instead of going to families, going to unrelated individuals with one phenotype at a time. And what we're doing now as we're maturing in all of these sciences is that we're doing this in the context of large medical systems or enormous cohorts that are very well phenotyped across hundreds of phenotypes sometimes with our complete electronic health record. So you can now start relating, not just one gene segregating one family, not just thousands of variants segregating with one phenotype, but now you can do millions of variants versus hundreds of phenotypes. And as a computer scientist, I mean, deconvolving that matrix, partitioning it into the layers of biology that are associated with every one of these elements, is a dream come true. It's it's like the world's greatest puzzle. And you can now solve that puzzle by throwing in more and more knowledge about the function of different genomic regions and how these functions are changed across tissues and in the context of disease. And that's what my group and many other groups are doing. We're trying to systematically relate this genetic variation with molecular variation at the expression level of the genes at the epigenomic level of the gene regulatory circuitry and at the cellular level of what are the functions that are happening in those cells at the single cell level using single cell profiling and then relate all that vast amount of knowledge computationally with the thousands of traits that each of these of thousands of variants are perturbing. I mean, this is something we talked about, I think last time, so there's these effects at different levels that happen. You said at a single cell level, you're trying to see things that happen due to certain perturbations. And then so it's not just like a puzzle of um, perturbation and disease. It's perturbation, then effect at a cellular level, then at an organ level, at a body. Like, how do you disassemble this into like what your group is working on? You're basically taking a bunch of the hard problems in the space. How do you break apart a difficult disease uh, and break it apart into problems that you, into puzzles that you can now start yeah. solving? So there's a struggle here. Computer scientists love hard puzzles. And they're like, oh, I wanna you know, build a method that just deconvolves the whole thing computationally. And you know that's very tempting and it's very appealing, but biologists just like to, decouple that complexity experimentally to just like peel off layers of complexity experimentally. And that's what many of these modern tools that you know my group and others have both developed and used. The fact that we can now figure out tricks for peeling off these layers of complexity by testing one cell type at a time or by testing one cell at a time. And you could basically say, what is the effect of this genetic variant associated with Alzheimer's on human brain? Human brain, Sounds like, oh, it's an organ, of course, just go one organ at a time. But human brain has, of course, dozens of different brain regions. And within each of these brain regions, dozens of different cell types. And every single type of neuron, every single type of glial cell, between astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, between you know all of the neural cells and the vascular cells and the immune cells, that are co-inhabiting the, the brain between the different types of excitatory and inhibitory neurons that are sort of interacting with each other between different layers of neurons in the cortical layers. Every single one of these has a different type of function to play in cognition, in interaction with the environment, 
in maintenance of the brain, in energetic needs, in feeding the brain with blood, with oxygen, in clearing out the debris that are resulting from the super high energy production of cognition in, in humans. So all of these things are basically um, potentially deconvolvable computationally, but experimentally, you can just do single cell profiling of dozens of regions of the brain across hundreds of individuals, across millions of cells. And then now you have pieces of the puzzle that you can then put back together to understand that complexity. I mean, first of all, I mean, the human brain, the cells in the human brain are the most, okay, maybe I'm romanticizing it, but cognition seems to be very complicated. So uh, separating into the, the function, breaking Alzheimer's down to the cellular level seems very challenging. Is that basically you're trying to find a way that some perturbation in the genome results in some obvious major dysfunction in the cell. You're, you're trying to find something like that. Uh, e exactly. So, so what does human genetics do? Human genetics basically looks at the whole path from genetic variation all the way to disease. So human genetics has basically taken thousands of Alzheimer's cases and thousands of controls matched for age, for sex, for you know uh, environmental backgrounds and so on and so forth. And then looked at that map where you're asking what are the individual genetic perturbations and how are they related to all the way to Alzheimer's disease. And that has actually been quite successful. So we now have you know more than 27 different loci. These are genomic regions that are associated with Alzheimer's at this end-to-end -end level. But the moment you sort of break up that very long path into smaller levels, you can basically say from genetics, what are the epigenomic alterations at the level of gene regulatory elements where that genetic variant perturbs the control region nearby? That effect is much larger. You mean much larger in terms of its down the line impact? or It's much larger in terms of the measurable effect, this A okay. versus B, variance is actually so much cleanly defined when you go to the shorter branches. Because for one genetic variant to affect Alzheimer's, that's a very long path. Yeah. That basically means that in the context of millions of these six million variants that every one of us carries, that one single nucleotide has a detectable effect all the way to the end. I mean, it's just mind boggling that that's even possible but indeed, yeah, crazy. yeah but indeed but, there are such effects. So the hope is, or the most scientifically speaking, the, the most effective place where to detect the alteration that results in disease is er earlier on in the pipeline, as so, early so as possible. It's a, it's, it's a trade-off. If you go very early on in the pipeline, now each of these epigenomic alterations, for example, this enhancer control region is active maybe 50% less, which is a dramatic effect. Now you can ask, well, how much does changing one regulatory region in the genome in one cell type change disease? Well, that path is now long. So if you instead look at expression, the path between genetic variation and the expression of one gene goes through many enhancer regions, and therefore it's a subtler effect at the gene level, but then now you're closer because one gene is acting on, on, you know, in the context of only 20,000 other genes, as opposed to one enhancer acting in the context of two million other enhancers. So you basically now have genetic, epigenomic, the circuitry, transcriptomic, the gene expression level, and then cellular, where you can basically say, I can measure various properties of those cells. What is the calcium influx rate when I have this genetic variation? What is the synaptic density? what is the electric impulse conductivity, and so on and so forth. So you can measure things along this path to disease, and you can also measure endophenotypes. You can basically measure you know, um, your brain activity. You can do imaging in the brain. You can basically measure, I don't know, the heart rate, the pulse, the lipids, the amount of blood secreted, and so on and so forth. And then through all of that, 
you can basically get at the path to causality, the path to disease.